said on Sunday that you need to be here. I said on Sunday that you need to be here so that you can go through this so that you can make disciples. And so Jack and I were talking about it, and he was like, you know, the people who are going to be there are going to be your team. That's it. Because you make a way. When, when something's important, if you can make a way to play Pokemon Go, and these adults are spending all their time playing this stupid game. Yeah. And if you can make a, if I told you there was going to be a million dollars, you would quit your job, you would do whatever you had to do to be here. And that's the way we need to run after this. We need to run, and I'm not telling you to go quit your job, because I don't have anything for you to do here at the church. So it's kind of like when you go over to the mission house to volunteer to help, and you're standing around like, can I do this, can I do this? And they're like, nope, we got it. So all I'm saying is make, this, this has to be a priority. Making disciples has to be a priority, because we are a discipleship church. And it's funny how many people have come to me in the last week and a half, two weeks, and said, you know, we're really more of a mission than we are a church. And, and it's funny because that was the first thing I got the very first time I was here in December was, this is a mission. This isn't a church. And if you've ever spent any time as a missionary or going down to Mexico, a mission, they have church services there, but there's so much more than that. They have English as a second language. They have an orphanage. They have men's homes and women's homes. And that's what we are. That's what we are. We really are. And so I'm in the process of working with the United Methodist Church to become a mission because that way apportionments would be paid to the mission. Other churches would support us instead of us supporting other churches. And so we would become just like the United Methodist Children's Home and we'd become just like the women's shelter. We'd become, and so that's where we are going. And I've talked to the PPR members and I've talked to different people and everybody's like, oh my gosh, we've been wanting to do that for 10 years. So... That is in development. I'm excited about it because that would mean we would be a line item in people's budget. Bigger churches, would, we would be, they would give 12% of their giving to us so we could go and then... Because what we do is we do the, the gritty, grimy, greasy gospel that no one wants to do. See, the, the churches that are social clubs, we do the things that make them feel good about themselves. Because by giving us $1,000, they go, we did that. By sending a missionary down for a week to help clean up this neighborhood over here, they feel like it gives them the warm and fuzzies. When we're out here with boots on the ground, we're out here, right? We're out here doing the work. So, and that's okay. I, I need, I need the, the rich white people to support us here at Springfield. So, all right. We're going to get into this. Christian versus disciple. So tonight, you're going to have to come to a decision which one you are. Every disciple is a Christian, but not every Christian is a disciple. Hear what I said. Every disciple is a Christian, but not every Christian is a disciple. Calling yourself a believer means nothing. Satan believes in Jesus. Discipleship means you are devoted. Amen. So, remember, all of this is going to apply to you, but not all of this is going to apply to you. So you're both a believer. I'm a terrible speller. B-E-L-I-E, -E. see? I would have totally butchered that. So you're both believers, but this one is devoted. Get it? So even up here on the title, you're both, you're a Christian, but this doesn't go this way. See what I'm saying? So on every single one of these, this goes over here, but this does not go over here. It is not a flow chart like that. So... The difference between a Christian is a Christian is a fan and a disciple is a follower. Do you get it? So now you're a fan, but they're not followers. See, just claiming a, to be a Christian means nothing. So you have to ask yourself, are you a pansy Christian or are you a radical warrior disciple? Are you a Bible-packing, devil-smacking, demon-hunting, sin-punting, blood-bought, net-caught, love-spreading, cut, cult-shredding, ignore-the-deceiver, blood-soaked, born-again believer? Amen. That's what you should be able to say when someone says, what are you? Yes. What are you? I am, and, and back in, when I was a kid, way back in, in the early 80s, for some of you, you're like, 
the early 80s. I already had six kids by the early 80s. Um, but in the early 80s, they would say, they, they had this saying where they would say, I'm a blood-washed, it ended with born-again believer. I'm a blood-washed, blood what is it? Blood bought, yeah, blood washed. Blood bought. No, blood bought. Bible toting something. Yeah, blood bought, Bible toting, devil stomping, born again believer, something like that. And that was kind of the mantra. And so, this, these are the questions that you have to ask yourself. Are you? Because this one here. So, blood bought is possession, forgiveness is passive. Do you get the difference? So the Christian is forgiven, the disciple is blood-bought. He realizes that he was purchased. He realizes or she realizes that this is not a game, that everyone's forgiven by the blood of the Lamb, but not everybody has stepped into being blood-bought. By, by the blood of the Lamb. Everyone is loved. You're in love. So all of us, all of us have been forgiven of sins. All of us have been purchased. But not all of us step into our gift. And so what does it mean to be a disciple? And this is something you have to ask. This is very personal. This is just you and God. Very few people know what it means to be a Christian. Very few people can articulate what it means to be a Christian. Very few people know that that word was something that they used to mock us. Just like the word Methodist. Did you know that when, when John and Charles Wesley were at Oxford, they were being mocked, being called Methodists? Oh, there they go. There's those Methodists. And Charles Wesley was really hurt and upset by that. And John goes, that's what we're going to call ourselves. And he goes, no, 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 no. They're, they're making fun of us. And he goes, well, why are they making fun of us? Well, they're saying that we're methodical in our worship. And we're methodical in our Bible reading. And we're methodical in our holiness. And he waited and just, he just waited until Charles got it. And then Charles went, oh. You see, the Romans were making fun of us and calling us little Jesuses. Christians. Well, look at them. They're, they're Christ-like. Look at them. What idiots. Who would worship this guy that we tortured? Who would worship this guy that we stripped down naked and made fun of and spit on? How stupid. And then they got it. Oh. Maybe he's real. Because if he, why would they do that if it was fake? Why would they do that? And so just like John Wesley, he took on a moniker that no one would forget. Because they're already calling us that. So we're going to get t-shirts printed up that say Methodists. So it's kind of like, okay, good. And? And I used to teach that to junior high kids. When I, when I very first started as a junior high pastor, I was 15 years old. And, and these kids would come to me getting picked on. And they would say, well, they keep calling me fat. And I'd say, well, are you fat? Yeah, kind of. Okay. So tell them that. And they would go, what do you mean? I'd say, tell them. Okay, that one's obvious. So these kids would start going, hey, fatty. And they would go, okay, we've heard that one. That one's obvious. Give me something that's really going to hurt. And the kids would go, uh, uh, uh. Hey, white guy. Oh. Oh, ma, let me, let me pull this dagger out. That doesn't hurt my feelings. And then they would start to say things like, well, he's calling my mom this and he's calling my mom that. And I'd say, well, is your mom that? No. Well, then why does it bother you? He doesn't know your mom. And so when you take away the enemy's swords and you take away these things and you stop getting your feelings hurt and stop getting offended, you take away his power. And that's the difference between a Christian and a disciple. When you recognize the tools of the enemy, you see, a Christian gets offended... And the disciple goes on the offense. Get what I'm saying? He takes those tools that Satan uses against him and he turns it, or her, and he turns it back on the enemy. But the Christian gets their feelings hurt and walks away and gets offended. What, what, if Satan can offend you, you're powerless. 
If he can get you off track, see the biggest tool of the enemy is time. If he can waste your time, he's got you. So, very few people know what it means to be a Christian. Even fewer people know what it means to be a disciple. And still fewer people than that are being either. Because if we want to get real, most people that claim to be Christian aren't even being Christ-like, let alone being a disciple. So, a Christian is a believer, like we said, and a disciple is a follower. When Jesus said, he never said, believe in me. The only time he said that was John 3, 16, that anyone who believes in me shall have everlasting life. But everywhere else he says, follow me. What must I do to be saved? Follow me. Well, what, 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 what should I do? Sell all that you own and follow me. So it's like joining a football team. See, we can either simply be a Christian and sit on the bench and simply believe in our team, or we can play a position on that team and truly get in the game. So, this is a bench warmer, and this is a player. Or as the gangsters say, play a. Uh. No, I'm, that was a bad, that was a dad humor joke. Um, the terms disciple and Christian are similar, but they are not synonyms. They are not the same. There's churches that are teaching it's the same. It goes hand in hand. But if you've never been through discipleship, you are not a disciple. It's just like if you, if you live in a bottle, that doesn't make you a Pepsi. Sorry. And I mean, I can tell you it does and I can make you feel better, but it's not the truth. So what's the difference? A Christian simply believes in Christ, but a disciple has follow through. A Christian has an experience and a disciple has evidence. Do you get what I'm saying? So this, you had some sort of experience. You had some sort, and I'm going to butcher this, I'm sure. You had some sort of, I used to teach school, and every time somebody corrected my spelling, they would get 10 points off their grade. <laughs> and I'm not joking. If anybody even made a sound. Because, you know, people with OCD especially will go, oh, it's so not I before E on this one. So English is the stupidest, stupidest language in the world. I want us all to go to Hebrew or Latin or something, one of the godly languages, because English is demonic. So, anyway. <laughs> so, a disciple is a close follower and a deep learner of Jesus Christ. A close follower of Christ who deeply learns the doctrines of Scripture and the lifestyle that they require. That's deep. That you'll have to probably listen to a couple more times. To be a Christian simply comes when your faith is grounded in the love and the grace of God and that you've had experience through Jesus Christ and you are empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's all that it is. Hear me again. You had some sort of experience and then you've been forgiven by Jesus Christ and you've been empowered by the Holy Spirit. But it takes you stepping into that to become a disciple. The biggest difference between being a Christian and being a disciple is this. Desire. What is your desire? You see, we're supposed to go from our worldly, lustful desires. We're supposed to go, when we become a Christian, we're supposed to start to, our desires are supposed to change. And that's the biggest difference between the two is desire. What do you desire? See, discipleship is the desire to go deeper and deeper into the base and deeper into the response to God's love and God's grace. Discipleship focuses on actively following the footsteps of Jesus. So this is passive faith, and this is active faith. See, faith without works is what? Dead. dead, right? And works without faith is also dead. Because that's what a lot of good people in the world do. They have great works. Mormons are some of the nicest. I was telling Jack, I used to manipulate Mormons. And this is going to sound terrible, and, and many of you probably, it'll probably hurt your feelings. But I grew up in Mesa, Arizona, Tempe, Chandler, Gilbert, Phoenix, and there's a lot of Mormons. The second largest temple in the United States is in Mesa, Arizona. And they believe that when Joseph Smith comes back to resurrect his people, that Mesa is going to be where the overflow from Salt Lake City is, and there's all kinds of different, when you get your own planet. It's, it's, if you've never studied Mormonism, I have a position paper that I wrote in Bible college called The Cults of Christianity, and how... They will tell you that they're Christians. 
But what I used to do was, if you find out about the rule of the Mormon neighbor, they have to do anything that you ask if they live on your block. So what I would do is manipulate the rule of the Mormon neighbor, and I would say, hey, my car broke down, is there any way you could help me? And they would have a team of people come, and they would fix your car, and they can't charge you, and they, can't, they do it for free. So every time I would have any issue, so what I would do is purposefully drain the gas out of my mower and sit there and I would watch when the Mormon neighbor was out and I would try to start my mower and I'd be like, oh. and we lived on an acre. And I would go, I just can't get this thing started. They'd say, you know what, we'll mow your grass. And I would go, Mormon neighbor, Mormon neighbor. And so what they're hoping is that by being their, your Mormon neighbor that you'll come to become a Mormon. Well, they didn't know that I was a, a, a blood-bought Satan stomping, wow. devil chomping, Bible toting, born again, blood washed believer. So I just let them, they needed it to get to the seventh level of the celestial kingdom. So I wasn't doing anything wrong. I was actually helping them get to their, their own planet in the, in the galaxy of Tretron and on the planet of Arbunian. And some of you think I'm joking, but I, I can show you a cartoon from the 60s that actually teaches children how to become gods. To be anyway, so so crazy. Okay, so to be a disciple of Christ, we cannot be passive spectators, but we must be energetic participants in God's activities in the world. Discipleship focuses on actively following, actively following. So you go from being passive to active, passive to active. To be, you must. God, you, you must live out what God has done for us, and we must offer our lives back to God. That's the difference. A Christian simply believes in Christ, and he keeps the gift <coughs> that was given. We, as disciples, give back. And so we take the Christianity, we take the cross, we take the crucifixion, and we take it on as our, our, I don't even know what the word I'm looking for. We take it on as our, we possess it. We take it on as our identity, and then we give it back each morning and each night. We give it back to God and say, use me however you would see fit. Whereas a Christian holds on to it as tight as they can because that's all they have is fire insurance. Do you get what I'm saying? So this one has fire insurance. <clears throat> and we have security. Amen. I can't tell you how many young people, 20s, early 30s that I talk to, and I say, you know, if you were to die tonight, do you know that you know that you know that you know? Now listen to me. Do you know that you know that you know that you know that you would stand before Jesus? And they say, I hope so. That scares me. I couldn't go to sleep. If I didn't know that I know that I know that I know, I could not go to sleep. So we order our lives in a way that embodies Christ in his ministry, in our families, in our workplaces, in our communities, in our world, if we are disciples. If we are not, we hold it for our own selfishness. We don't share it. We're like the guy that, that buried, dug a hole and buried his talent and then covered it up because he was afraid of what the master was going to do. So the book of Theology and Discipline breaks it down into three parts. In order to be a disciple, we must be loving God, loving our neighbors, and making disciples. So first, discipleship is about truly loving God. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew twenty-two, thirty-four. 34. And I'm starting to get too old for this small Bible, but I love it because it's, I can put it in my pocket. But I actually had to buy my first reading glasses the other day, and it's pretty embarrassing. All right. It is. It is. You're laughing. Some of you people who are, who are on your uh, XYZ ministry are laughing at me. But I just bought mine a month ago. Really? No. Well, that's Jack and I. Jack and I went to grammar school together. Jack tries to pretend he's older, but he actually he and I went to Springfield Elementary together. So early nineties. Early 90s. I'm about a year older. Yeah, he graduated a year at, before me. So, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, uh-oh, 
That's bad news. Ask him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And I love this. This is one of the coolest scriptures ever. If you, if you don't get anything else tonight, get this. This is Jesus. You know, some people get upset when I say Jesus was a gangster. And what I mean by Jesus was a gangster was he was a guy that didn't put up with anybody's garbage. He did not put up with the man telling him what to do. He came with a purpose, and he would smack people across the face with God's word. And this is what he said. Which one is the greatest commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So some people get really confused by that. I have a lot of friends that are Messianic Jews, and they get really, really confused by that. So is he saying that you, you could just throw away the Ten Commandments? No. What he's saying is, if you love your neighbor as yourself and you love God, you're not going to, you're not going to break one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. You're just not going to. Number one, we've first begun. God should be first in your life. Number two, the idol rule, those graven images aren't nice. Number three, God's name should be never spoken in jest. And number four, the Sabbath for our worship and for rest. Number five, we all should strive to honor father and mother. Number six, don't get your kicks from killing one another. Number seven, life is heaven when you're true to your mate. Number eight, don't steal and hate this rule for goodness sake. Number nine, don't be the kind that goes around telling lies. And number ten, don't covet when you see your neighbor's house or wife. So if you take those ten commandments, I learned that in fifth when I was five years old, and I still remember it. That's why you train children in the way they should go. I was five years old. It was a little play that we did for Christmas. And I still remember it. Maybe that's how I got became a rapper, was that, that first little introduction. So, number one, he already said, God should be first. Number two, those graven images aren't nice. Number three, God's name should be never spoken in jest. So one, two, and three are covered by love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. Number four is the Sabbath. So then, once again, God. You're, you're putting God first. Number five, we all should strive to honor father and mother. That's loving your neighbor as yourself. Number six, number six, that's how I have to do this. I have to sing the song to remember it. Number six, don't get your kicks from killing one another. So, number six, you see what I'm saying? So each one of these is covered by those simple commandments. And the reason he did that was to make things simple because we're making things too difficult. And see, that's the difference. Christians live by rules, and disciples live by relationship. And I don't know about you, but if this was a telemarketing, I mean, if this was a timeshare presentation, you wouldn't have to do much more to sell me. If this was the gold step standard, and this was the triple diamond standard, you wouldn't have to do, I wouldn't care what the cost was. But a lot of people do care about the cost. Because the cost is a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. So, it is more than acknowledgement of God's existence or having a statement of belief regarding God. It is total devotion. It is head over heels love and adoration. It is the deep desire to know God, to be one with God, and to worship God. There are a variety of ways that we can develop our knowledge and our love for God. These include prayer, Bible study, worship, and fellowship with other disciples. You see, you've got to stick with the winners. You've got to stick with other disciples because iron sharpens iron. You, can't, you have to bring Christians up to your level as a disciple. Because otherwise, they're going to bring you back down to the lukewarm state of Christianity that it is today. Because 80% of America calls themselves Christians. Does it look like 80% of America is Christians? I mean, look around you. John Wesley called these practices means of grace. They are means for developing our relationship with God and our experience of God's presence in our lives. These practices... Help us spend time with God 
And it's a significant factor in loving God. And that is prayer, Bible study, fellowship, worship, and being around other disciples. Becoming a disciple takes us from a spectator to a participant. From an acquaintance... And I'm not even going to try to spell that. We're going to put aqua. (laughs) So if anybody corrects my spelling, you're going to hell. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Everybody's like, what? To a friend. From an acquaintance or an aqua, as I like to call it, to a friend. So turn with me to John chapter 15, verse 15. Because listen, if preachers get up here and they tell you all this stuff and they can't back it up with Scripture, it's usually not true. Just just to key you in. It's usually from the book of opinions. Chapter 4, verse 12. That was a joke. The book of opinions isn't a real book. Okay, never mind. Okay, so, it's not in there. John chapter 15, verse 15. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Now, what people do is they take that scripture out of context. They say that, well, any Christian can ask for anything in his name, and it'll be given to you. But that's not what he said. He said that a Christian is a slave, or this acquaintance, And a a disciple is a friend. And it's those friends that can ask anything according to God's will. That's the difference. See, some people are preaching this prosperity gospel where you can go lay your hands on a Rolls Royce and he'll give you one. For what? But if you go lay your hands on a vacant building because you you know that God has called you to open up an orphanage, he's going to give it to you. I've seen it time and time and time again. So as Jackie was saying on Sunday morning, I'm a guy that's going to push you and I'm going to prod you and I'm going to make sure that you're doing what God's purposed you to do, even if you hate me for it. I'm a motivator. I'm a catalyst. That's what I do. I push people and I constantly, you can ask almost anybody in here that I've had any conversation with, what do you really feel like you're supposed to do? Well, I'm a mailman. No, stop it. That's not what I said. What do you feel like you're supposed to do? And some of you I've asked might be 80 years old, and I've still said, what do you feel like you're supposed to do? Well, I've always wanted to work with babies. Then go do that. Well, I'm, 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 go do that. Yeah. I was on a suicide call last night. Um, I, I'm very active in Alcoholics Anonymous. And the reason I'm still active, a lot of Christians, are they, they look at me like, why do you still go to those meetings? I go to those meetings because I'm like to those meetings. You see, the Buddhists will go to those meetings and they'll say, I have a higher power who I choose to call Buddha. I have a higher power who I choose to call Allah. I have a higher power who I choose to call Hare Krishna. I get to say, I have a higher power who I choose to call Jehovah Jireh. I have a higher power who I choose to call Yahweh. I have a higher power who was crucified, died, and was risen for my sins who I choose to call Jesus Christ. And nobody can say anything. And I always wait until somebody else has made the mistake of saying it. Because then if they do tell me, oh, you can't really do that, I'll say, oh, really? Because you notice nobody gets offended by Buddha and Allah. I'm getting goosebumps. Nobody gets offended by Buddha and Allah and Hare Krishna and Joseph Smith, but they get offended by the name of Jesus Christ. So I'm there to offend people. But guess who they come to when they need someone to go into the prison? Guess who they come to when they need someone to talk to somebody that's suicidal? They don't go to Hare Krishna. They don't go to Buddha. They don't go to Allah. They don't go to Joseph Smith. They come to Jesus Christ. Every single time. So after the meeting last night, I sat with this kid for probably till midnight. And he was suicidal. He was homicidal. He was genocidal. And what I finally got to was that he was hurt by the church. That he was angry at God. And everyone, that, the other guy that was there laughed and said, you're talking to the right guy. 
And he rededicated his life to Christ and we're getting him taken care of. But listen, that didn't happen in the church. And that wouldn't have happened if I wasn't obedient to being out in the highways and the byways. Because I've even had other pastors in the Methodist church tell me that I shouldn't tell people that I'm an alcoholic or I'm a recovering addict or I'm a recovering this or I'm a recovering that. that that's going to blow my witness. And I said, no. Uh, see, you see it as weakness. Christ sees it as meekness. And I boast in my weakness so that he can work through my weakness. And I'm sorry that everything rhymes, but that's just, that's just how I roll, literally. So... Next, discipleship is about loving our neighbor. Jesus responded to questions about the most important commandment by quoting the Hebrew scriptures, the admo- the admonish the A D M O N I T I O N to love God <laughs> with our whole being. Then immediately he broadened the meaning of his that word. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. These verses about loving God and loving your neighbor are ourselves were known as the great, greatest commandment. He put those two together. That is the greatest commandment, the great commandment. So Jesus teaches us that loving God and loving our neighbor are two sides of the same coin. That you cannot, hear what I'm saying, you cannot love God and have hate in your heart. You cannot love God and hate black people or white people or Filipinos. You can't do it. Show me a man who says he loves God that hates his neighbor and I will show you a liar. And I will tell him that to his face. It is two sides of the same coin. We cannot do one without the other. First of all, loving our neighbor means responding to specific needs, hunger, illness, imprisonment, loneliness, and so forth. Love is more than a feeling, it's a behavior. Right. That's right. It is a practical and concrete means of grace. You see, churches that aren't doing what we're doing, they're not loving their neighbor. When you take up so much money in the collection plate that it takes buckets... <laughs> I've been to churches where they have this this celebration and they have five-gallon buckets. And then you ask them what they're doing for outreach, what they're doing for missionaries, what they're doing for this. And when I say missionary, Jack and I talk about it. It's a huge pet peeve of mine. If your neighborhood has not been reached for Christ, why are you going to China? If you have sick and lonely and hurting children in your backyard, why are you going to Africa? Unless God has specifically called you to Africa, you need to take care of Springfield. Because the two sides of that same coin, you cannot love God and hate your neighbor. Well, who is my neighbor? It starts with your family. If you don't take care of your family unit, your core... You're just like, if, if, if you're just like that, if you just, just don't take care of them, you don't love God. And then if all you do is take care of them, you're just like the pagans, because that's all they do. So if you're not taking care of your family unit, and I'm not telling you to enable your kids that are on drugs or, or to, to love people outside of, of normal limits. I'm not telling you not to practice tough love because everybody who's dealt with me outside of Sunday or Wednesday knows that I'm a tough love guy. What I'm saying is, if you don't love your own family members, if you have strife and if you have resentment and unforgiveness within your family, you need to question your relationship with God. So, secondly, our neighbor includes many people. Within the context of the Christian community, our neighbors are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Neighbors also refer to the contemporary understanding of those who live near us. However, from a biblical perspective, neighbors include people who we might not normally consider, such as strangers, prisoners, people who mistreat us, people who are our enemies, people from other cultural or ethnic backgrounds, people from different religious traditions, people who irritate us and push the boundaries of our patience. Somebody say amen. Amen. Therefore, loving our neighbor requires attention and sacrifice. We have to pay attention to what is happening around us in order to see our neighbors and to recognize their needs. We must also consider their needs to be as important as our own in order to live out discipleship faithfully. 
Loving our neighbor is more than random acts of kindness. It takes time, energy, and commitment. It's a lifestyle carefully cultivated in response to God. Third, if we want to call ourselves disciples of Christ, we must understand that loving our neighbor is not an option. See, the Christian is stuck on self and the disciple is selfless. And literally, some people look at this word and they say, that's impossible. But break the word down and it means loving yourself less. Maybe it's just today. If you love yourself less today than you did yesterday, you're making progress. And I know that sounds funny and some of you are smiling, but I'm being serious. If you love yourself less today, if I'm less of a jerk today than I was yesterday, I'm making progress. Last night in, in this, this meeting I went to, they were talking about humility. And a lot of people were saying, like, humility was being humiliated by God. And they're saying all these things, and I'm just sitting there, like, in, just baffled. And I finally, I get to me, and, and somebody asks me to share, as they normally do, because they know that I'm going to M80 the group. And they know I'm going to explode. And so, they'll ask me. And, and so what I said last night was, C.S. Lewis said that humility was not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. And the whole room went dead silent. It's not being humiliated. It's laying all of your burdens at the master's feet and him going, come here and get up in my lap and let's fix this. That's humility. It's when we don't know what to do and we ask the father how to do it has nothing to do with your confidence or your swagger or the way you walk into a room. Because people will look at me and they'll say, oh, you're so arrogant, you're so this, you're so that. And I say, no, I just know who I am. I can't help it that you don't know who you are. My grandmother, when I was a little tiny kid, I think I was five or six years old, she's from Kempston, North Carolina, and that's how she talked. And she said, <laughs> she said darling, people are either going to love you or they're going to hate you. She said, and they hate you because they ain't you. And those words stuck with me. They hate me because they ain't me. And that's okay. Because Jesus said they're going to hate you. Matter of fact, if people don't hate you, you're probably doing something wrong. Right. You're probably living lukewarm Christianity. You see, Jesus said if you're lukewarm, what's he going to do? Yeah. So most Christians are living lukewarm. <coughs> to just above lukewarm. So we'll call it. Mm. <laughs> we'll call it warm. So he's not going to spit you out if you're warm. But disciples live red, hot, hot. And you know what I'm talking about. Like when you when you when you drink, I don't. Everybody that has ever made coffee for me, I always put like an inch of water in the coffee because I like to drink coffee. I don't like to sip coffee. But you know what I'm talking about when you burn your tongue and you think. And you, you even blow on it. You think it's going to be okay, and you take that first sip, and you just, just I mean, I mean third-degree burns on your tongue, and you feel it for about three days, and everything you taste. You can have the best lumpia in the world, and you would never know it, right? I hate that. I, there's nothing, the only thing I hate worse than getting my tongue burnt is wet socks. I hate wet socks. So you, you normally I'll be barefoot, but if it's ever raining, you'll always see me in flip-flops, because I hate having my feet wet. And it probably comes from, I went from military school straight into the army, and in the army they teach you every two clicks, every two kilometers you stop and you change your socks when it's raining. Because if you get trench foot, you're done. And trench foot, for those of you who don't know, that a mild version of trench foot is when you get your, you know how you get out of the bath and you're all pruny? Trench foot, it'll stay like that for like two or three weeks. It's almost permanent. And really bad trench foot, like in Vietnam, guys would lose their feet. Because they were just dead. And so, I want to get to the place where I'm so red hot that people can't, they have to sit. And most of you have already seen that in me. I'm, I'm, I, you can only take me in small doses. I'm, I, I, I will burn you if you get too close or if you sit me too fast. Amen. See? <laughs> now... Jack and Jackie like to pretend that I'm this, that, that, I'm, that I keep them awake, and that I talk a lot. But really, when I'm at their house, most of the time, I do this and just listen. 
And they just story after story after story. Are you writing me out of your will right now? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's what he's doing. He's doing my review. He's doing my review. Okay. So, loving your neighbor is not an option. It is what disciples do. It is who we are. We should be so loving that it makes people sick. Have you ever met somebody who's so sweet it gives you a cavity? Seriously. They are so sweet that they give you a cavity and you're almost like, oh my gosh. Now, I'm not saying you have to be that person. Like, you remember... uh, What's her name? Mrs. Poole on, uh, it was an 80s show where she would go, don't you know? Oh, thank you. Remember her? You guys don't remember her? She was on like, she was on Ferris Bueller. She was the secretary on Ferris Bueller. And then she was on a show called Hogan's Family. And then she was on Small Wonder where the guy invented a robot. Nobody watches TV. I'm the only heathen in here. You don't remember that? You know what? Heathen, yes. Television heathen. Okay. So it is who we are. It is what we do. Our lives are a testimony to our love and our love for God and our love for our neighbor. So the difference between a Christian is a Christian goes through tests and a disciple lives a testimony. Amen. And I know I'm overwhelming you and I know that some of you are like, good grief. This is four sermons in one. But that's the way that I do things because I want maybe some, something to digest. I want something to sort of hit you because I never know what God is going to use. And as I, believe it or not, almost every sermon I have, I've, I've cut it in half. So if that gives you any idea, growing up in the Assemblies of God, we would go until 2 o'clock and it would be, people would be disappointed. People would be like, 2 o'clock, he must have an appointment. So anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Finally, it's about not only being disciples, but making disciples. Do you get it? So a Christian is trying to become this, and we are making others this. Do you get it? They're trying to become disciples while we are busy making others disciples. Because we've got it. We've got it. We are disciples ourselves, and so therefore we can take somebody through discipleship. There's an old story. I use a lot of Irish stories, and there's an old Irish story about a guy who's in a hole, and he's in a hole, and it's six feet by six feet, and it's six feet deep. And he's in this hole, and he can't figure out how to get out. I'm sorry. It's six feet in diameter, and it's 12 feet deep. So he can't figure out how to get out. And so the whole time he's screaming and he's screaming and he's screaming and he's saying, somebody help me. And guys keep walking by and they go, hey, Charlie, just pull up. Just jump up and grab that root. And he's trying and he slips down and he falls and, and he's getting more and more tired and he's out of water and he's out of breath and he's like, I'm going to die. Somebody has to help me, please, please. And so people come by and now there's a whole group of people. And they're going, okay, try this. Put your foot right there. Oh, oh, and he falls again. Oh, well, try this. And everybody's just giving their opinions. And finally, one guy pushes through the crowd and he jumps in the hole. And he goes, let me show you how I got out. You put your foot here and you put your foot here and you put your foot here. Then you grab this root. Then you pull yourself up. Then you put your leg up. Then he jumps back in the hole and he says, now you try it. I'll wait till you get out and then I'll get out. Yeah. That's the difference. The difference is a Christian simply tells others what to do and a disciple shows others what to do. If you want what we have, you have to do what we do. So, turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. And some of this should be review for you and some of you are going to be like, I've never heard of this, I've never seen this. And, 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 and I, I, challenge, I always challenge new believers to read the book of John and then the book of Acts. And that'll sort of... I'm a Matthew guy only because that's how I was discipled and I was discipled on the book of Matthew. But John is a little bit easier to understand. So, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Go! Exclamation point. That's, it. that's how it was written. 
It's not in most versions, but that's how it was written. Go! Exclamation point. Therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Amen, meaning so be it. It is sealed. It is done. That's it. The book's over. The movie's over. The credits are rolling. Don't you think it's important that we follow his last words? Yeah. Did you hear that scripture? Did he say, go therefore and preach really pretty sermons and then at the end say, with every head bowed and every eye closed? Did, you, did, did he say that? Did he say, did he say to go out and evangelize and tell people that they're going to hell? Where did this come from? Where did this hellfire and brimstone preaching come from? I want to know. Because if you think about Azusa Street Revival, or you think about Aldersgate, or you think about Brownsville, or you think about the Toronto Blessing, or you think about the Carolina Revival that's going on right now, or you think about Lifestyle Christianity with Todd White, these great movements, there is no hell mentioned. Because you can't tell a heroin addict they're going to hell because they're going to tell you, I'm in hell! So why would I be scared of it? I'm living in hell. I inject hell into my veins every single day. What does hell have to do with me? You see, Christians, what they preach is punishment. Punish. Don't say anything. Punishment. And what we preach is love, grace, and mercy, or what I like to call the Trinity of Faith. Because that's what brought me out of my mess. I would never, ever, ever have come if somebody would. And this is, this is a guy that was forced to go to Baptist camp, Baptist VBS, Baptist this, Baptist that. I would have never come to Christ, for real, if a Catholic priest wouldn't have said, let's forget about hell for a minute. Let's just forget about it. I want to talk to you about love. And he held me in his arms. And he said, none of this is your fault. None of this is your fault. Then he told me about God's grace. As he's just, I'm literally just turning into just mush. And then he told me about mercy. And he said, the God that they're preaching to you over here is not the God who I'm telling you about here. You see, some of you might know who Jesus is, and you might have heard of Jesus, but you don't know Jesus. Right. To know Jesus as your bridegroom, to know Jesus, you see, it's the difference between hearing <coughs> and listening. Do you get what I'm saying? We can hear loud music, but unless we're listening to it, we don't even know what it's saying. So, Jesus didn't win souls or get people to accept him. He made disciples. Did you know that any given time there was 300 to 5,000 people following him literally? When he said, follow me, yeah. he meant it. He meant physically follow me. Quit your jobs and come on. And see, we often, we often say, well, the kingdom of heaven is near. No, no, no. The kingdom of heaven is here. It was Christ Jesus himself. And he has put that kingdom of heaven inside of us when we accept Christ into our heart. When we, when we accept, see, that's the difference. This, the Christian, accepts Christ as Savior. We accept Christ as Lord. Big difference. <coughs> they give their heart we give our lives. We give every part of us, every nook and cranny. We, we stand before him naked and say, this is it. This is me. You can have it, all of me. Where they just open up a tiny little spot in their heart. So why did Jesus not preach salvation? Why did he preach discipleship? Because believing is passive and Jesus wants active relationships with his disciples. These words are significant because the church 
their understanding of its mission is flawed. In the last conversation Jesus has with the disciples, he sends them into the world to share the good news of God's love and grace. He calls them to the ministry of proclamation, teaching, baptism, and obedience. (coughs) Hear what I'm saying? He said, teach them, and people forget that too. They forget that it said, teaching them to be obedient to my ways. They just hear, baptize them, and, and make disciples. But he says, teach them what I've taught you. Teaching and proclaiming and teaching and baptizing and teaching obedience. He describes their ministry as making disciples. If you back up a few verses to find where and when this conversation takes place, it was the resurrected Christ as he met the 11 disciples on the mountain in Galilee. At this point, Judas Iscariot had already hung himself. Now, if you look at Matthew 5, which is one of the earliest accounts that, G- that Matthew gives of Jesus' ministry, in this passage known as the Sermon on the Mount, where do we find Jesus? There he is, up on a mountain, and he is talking about it. He, what's he talking about? What's he talking about during the Sermon on the Mount? You probably guessed it. He's talking about discipleship. That's what he was talking about. The Sermon on the Mount was not talking about just simply belief. He's talking about discipleship. Jesus speaks to the crowd and says, You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to the whole house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works. And give glory to the Father in heaven. You see, Jesus is on a mountaintop teaching about discipleship. About loving God and loving your neighbor. And the beginning of his ministry. And at the end of his earthly life and his ministry, he's talking about discipleship. He talks about it at the beginning when he takes on the disciples. He talks about it in the middle. He talks about it. He's constantly talking about discipleship. And see, Matthew frames the life and ministry of Jesus Christ with these stories. To emphasize his theological understanding about who Jesus was and who Jesus is. Think for a moment about who else in the Bible went up on the mountain and came back down with the word from God. If you look at it, it's in Exodus 19 and 20 when Moses met God on Mount Sinai after leading the Hebrews out of slavery in Egypt in his obedience to the God's commands, to God's commands, not the God. I mean the God, yes, but I didn't mean to a God. There in the wilderness, God gave the Ten Commandments to the Israelites through God's spokesperson, Moses. These commands became the centerpiece of the Jewish law that defined God's covenant relationship with His people. See, Matthew's Gospel establishes a parallel between Moses and Jesus as prophets and as spokespersons for God. Just as the Hebrews of long ago believed that God acted through Moses to free them from slavery and teach them about life and relationship with God, so we as Christians, as disciples, as true believers and blood-bought, born-again people, we believe that God acted through Jesus to free us from the slavery of sin and death. And that He teaches us about a life in relationship with God. That life for Christians and disciples is based not only on conformity to rules and regulations, but the love and grace and mercy of God through Jesus Christ. Discipleship is our response to this great gift. We must decide each morning who and what we are going to be. Are we going to be passive or are we going to be active? Are we going to be spectators or are we going to be participants? Are we going to be talkers Talkers and doers. See, I always say, you can talk about it, or you can be about it. So, tonight I'm going to make you do something very difficult. I've been preaching this same sort of message for 25 years, 22 years. And it's always uncomfortable. What I'm going to ask you is if you believe that you are a Christian, I want you to stand against this wall. And if you believe you are a disciple of Christ, I want you to stand against that wall. And this is a moment where you have to make a decision. And then if you have not accepted Christ as your Savior, and you're not even sure if you're a Christian, I want you to stay in your seat. And you'll see why in a minute. This is not to embarrass you. This is to to bring about fulfillment. So, 
We have three honest people and a whole bunch of people. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so now I want to talk to you. Normally what I do, are, are you staying seated because you're not sure if you're a Christian or a disciple? <laughs> are you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm kind of... Okay, that's okay. So I want to talk to you first. And this is what I do. And normally there's kids sitting, when I do this at youth retreats and camps, there's kids sitting in the middle. Because they're not sure. Because now they look at this list and they go, holy crap. I'm not even sure if I'm that. And that's a scary place to be. She's saying, I'm not sure if I'm a Christian or a disciple. These kids sitting here are going, I'm not even sure if I'm a believer. I'm not even sure. Imagine how that must feel. Imagine if going, I don't know. I don't know if I've had an experience. I don't know if I'm even sitting on the bench. I might be still in the bleachers. I don't know if I'm being, if I, I don't even tell people about Jesus. I don't know if I'm even considered a slave. I don't even know if I'm in the same camp or even in the same book as this guy. And so, as we sit here, what I would normally do is I would pray, and they would ask Jesus into their heart. And after they asked Jesus into their heart, they would go over to this wall. And then I would talk to these people and say, what's holding you back? What's holding you back from being a disciple? And most of them, if they were honest, they would say, training. No one has discipled me. And unfortunately, and the Assemblies of God used to be really big into discipleship, and they've dropped the ball. And so even I would have youth pastors on that wall. And they would say to me, no one's ever taken me through discipleship. I don't know. Because I can't sit here and honestly tell you. And then what happens is, as I'm telling this, people start slinking their way back to that wall. Because they realize they're not being honest with themselves. And if you need to do that, please do that before we pray with this group. So they start saying, I don't know if I'm devoted. I don't know if I've made Jesus my Lord. I'm not sure if I'm being honest about it. I don't know if I'm a true follower of Christ. You see, most people, and this is a big decision, and I wait till the very end to do this. Christians are willing to live. Disciples are willing to die. Now, this might change your mind. If a man came in here with a shotgun tonight and said, either get on that wall or you're going to die on this wall, how many of you would stay on that wall? That's a big question. That's the question. Are you living or are you willing to die for Jesus? Have you had an experience or are you living in evidence? And so this is your last chance to switch walls. And so now I come over here, and I, and I appreciate your honesty. I appreciate you switching walls. I really do. Because tonight's the last night that you're not a disciple. Because you're stepping into discipleship. And this is the group that I love the most because this is the one. Because I know there are a couple over there that are, that are wavering. And I loved your face when you went. You didn't, you didn't, there was no shame. There was no anything. You were like, you know what? I, I want to I double check, and I want to make sure. And I love that. That's awesome. So, right now, you guys are going to bow your heads and we're going to pray a simple prayer of faith. Which is, you're just going to repeat after me. Heavenly Father, make me a disciple. Help me to go from Savior to Lord. Thank you for making me a disciple and washing me in your blood. I'm ready to become active. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. That's it. Now you get to go to that wall. And this is where everybody usually is cheering and clapping and screaming. And so, so here is the deal. Now, now this is where it gets tough. Because now that all of you are standing over here, you have to make disciples. And so what I do is I give you another chance to go back over there. Because some people will actually refuse to do discipleship groups. They will refuse because now you guys are going to go through the next eight weeks... Next week, I'm going to have somebody else teach, and they're going to teach totally off topic, whatever God puts on their heart. But then for the eight Wednesdays, the next eight Wednesdays, we're going to go through discipleship class, and then you're going to get the materials, and you are going to then take on discipleship. <coughs> then for the next eight weeks after that, you're going to meet in your homes and coffee shops, wherever it may be, and we're starting core groups. Not cell groups, core groups. Because at the center of that core group is you. And they're your core. They're your people. And it's between 3 and 12 people. 
Whatever you feel like you can handle. And that's up to you. But you can never take on more than 12. Why? Because Jesus had it down to a science. And if Jesus only had 12, why in God's name would I let you have 20? That's foolish. Because honestly, I tell people to do 3 to 5 their first time. Because it, it gets heavy really deep, really quick. Yeah. And I start getting all these text messages like, oh my gosh, they asked me this. And what I tell people is, you know what? Be honest and say, I don't know, but let me find out. Never answer a question you don't know the answer to. I don't know, let me find out. I don't know, let me ask Pastor Seven. I don't know, let me research it. Because guess what? Google has every answer you can think of, even the wrong ones. So now what we're going to pray is we're going to pray this prayer of disciple maker. We're going to pray this prayer of patience and peace and confidence. Because that's as I look in some of your eyes, you're petrified and you're going, I can't disciple anybody. But what did I tell you? It's a requirement yeah. to make disciples. You don't have a choice anymore. And the only choice you have is to slink your way back over to that wall and, then and just... stay over there. And then we're going to pray the prayer and then you're going to have to come back over here anyway. <laughs> I mean, the Proverbs said, he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. How did you know you were naked? How did they know they were naked? How did they know? The, 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 you talking about Adam and Eve? Yeah. yeah. Because they, they had sinned. Like they transgressed against God's the word. Good, the good people. Yeah. And, and how did they feel after that? Yeah, they, Horrible. Sure. What did they do? They went, they went right out and what did they do? They covered themselves. They were afraid. Mm -hmm. And God said, who told you you were naked? So, now that you've been given this knowledge, and now that you know that you have to make disciples, some of you are going to freak out. And it happens. We had one guy come the next Wednesday and say, I got in my car and almost busted my airbag because I was punching it out of anger. Like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I want to come once every four weeks. I want to come when I feel like it. I, want, I don't want to have to be dependent on I don't want people having to, I don't want to meet people at Starbucks every week. I don't want to do that. But what's awesome is, we have all these disciple makers doing discipleship all over the city at different times, all over the place. You don't get to go and you, look, she's sitting down. She's, she's, no, I'm just joking. Look, she's like, I don't even want to be involved at all. I'm sitting back down. No, I'm just so, old. So this is what we're going to pray. We're going to pray this prayer that God would give you supernatural confidence, and supernatural abilities. And I challenge you to take a picture of this, and I'm going to put this on Facebook. Take a picture of this and remind yourself who you are and who you aren't. Who you are and who you aren't. Because you're no longer a Christian. You're a disciple. And you have to remind yourself that I'm not just a bench warmer anymore. I'm a player. You have to remind yourself you're not lukewarm to warm, you're red hot. And even when you don't feel like you are, you've got to remind yourself that you are. So let's close our eyes and bow our heads. And Heavenly Father, right now, we just pray supernatural confidence. We pray that we know who we are and whose we are. We know who we are in Christ and who God has made us to be. And we're following Matthew 28 when we go into the world and make disciples, not converts. We go and we multiply the Christ in us. We multiply ourselves. We multiply the divine nature of God. Father, I pray that you would just touch each person in here with a supernatural peace. That when they say they can't, you remind them you can. Father, we just praise you and we thank you for tonight that you opened our eyes to our responsibility to make disciples. We praise you and we thank you, Father, for these next eight weeks that are coming up where we go through training and we're stretched just like we would in a sporting event where we're stretched by our coach, Father. That this stretching might be uncomfortable, Father, but you would give us the peace that passes all understanding. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, Father. That you would make this discipleship fill up in our bellies and spill out of us with rivers of living water. We thank you, Father, for the groups that are going to spring up. The groups that are going to spring up in this room. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Another exciting thing is you get to do a dry run. For eight weeks, you go into groups of three to five yourself, and you take turns teaching as if the other three to five people are not who they are. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So week one, you're teaching one, two, three, four, five. 
and you get to pretend that there are five people who are just lukewarm Christians. And then the second week, you get to take the second week, and you get to teach these same five people. So you guys are in your own cell, your own core group, so you don't just get thrown out to the wolves. And so then you get to kind of work it out. It's kind of a dress rehearsal for eight weeks. And then the next time, you multiply. And the next time, you multiply. And here's what's crazy. It goes really quick. Remember how last week I did the penny, and the second day you get two cents, and the second day you get four cents? That's how this works. If you take three to five through, then, that, then those three to five take three to five through. Then those three to five take three to five through. By the time that happens, you're taking 12 through. And then you're taking 12 through, and then imagine how quickly when the 12 take 12 through, then the 12 take 12 through. Pretty soon, Springfield is, is a discipleship town. This same model has been used forever. This is how the early church started. And just to give you an example, my, my, my pastor at my home church years and years ago, Tommy Barnett, he started as a 15-year-old senior pastor in Davenport, Iowa. He, with this discipleship model, he shut down every strip club in Davenport, Iowa and made it illegal because all the strippers were disciples. At 15 years old, he wasn't even old enough to go into the strip clubs. And he shut them all down. That was his prayer. Father, make discipleship. And that town changed. And so, little Springfield, who most people look at it as, oh, it's just Springfield. Pretty soon people are going to go, what is going on? And it's not because of the pastor, it's not because of the church, it's because of what you're doing in the community and out in the world. It's boots on the ground. It's you putting your faith into action and not being passive. So, who's excited? I am. Who, just be honest with me, who's nervous? <laughs> Who feels unqualified, uneducated, and unworthy? Be honest. Because if you're not a little bit nervous, I'm scared. Because like, when I was on recruiting duty, if somebody came in wanting to be a sniper, and they didn't give me good reasons why, I would go, psycho! <laughs> he just wants to kill people and be legally allowed to. But when you come in saying, you know what, I just feel like it's something that I, I really want to do, I feel like it's, I'm an instrument, I'm blah, 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 and then I go, okay, cool. So, if you're not a little nervous, then you're not human. Really. If you're not a little bit nervous... If you're not a little bit, if you don't feel a little unqualified, then, then you will probably tonight or tomorrow. Or you will the first time that you're with real people that are looking to you and going, wait, what? But see, I make this so simple. I break it down and you'll have these teaching materials and you'll have all this stuff. You'll have everything and you'll teach it just like I taught it. Except instead of, I'm, I'm a guy that I'm presenting to a large group, but you'll be doing it like this. Ask yourself. And you'll be doing it just, just like I'm talking to just you guys. Are you passive or are you active? And they'll be taking notes, like some of you were. Are you passive or are you active? Ask yourself, are you a fan or are you a follower? And you'll have, see, before they even go through your discipleship class, right, they'll have an opportunity to become a disciple or themselves. And then that's the exciting thing is to see the light bulb go on. So, Heavenly Father, we just pray each, each person in here just go out with just a charge. Like they have been just hooked up to your mighty glory and plugged into your power. We ask you, Father, that you would just charge them up and get them excited about making disciples. Father God, we just thank you that this is a church and a mission that makes disciples, Father. That we don't just make converts, but we make disciples and we make passionate disciples followers, and deep, devoted people of God. We thank you, Father God, that we don't just stand on the world's definition of Christian, that we have gone deeper and we're going deeper into the ways of Jesus Christ so that we can go from being a slave to being a friend. We bless you and we thank you that even when we feel unqualified, uneducated, and unworthy, that you remind us who you are inside of us. We thank you, Jesus, for all you've done. We ask you to bless them and keep them until we see them again. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.